How are you guys doing? Good. Yeah. Oh, man, I, I love you guys. I am so excited uh, to just be worshiping the Lord together with you guys. I've just been having a great time this morning with you guys. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I, I'm just really humbled by this opportunity to uh, share the Word of God with you all this morning. And uh, today I have, I have a word for us on friendship. And, and friendship is just this common pursuit and desire uh, for all of us, every person, everywhere. And uh, it, it's just, friendship is foundational to our lives. And we, and we see this, right? And, and, and imagine if, uh, if you could have everything you ever wanted, and yet you didn't have any deep friends. Man, life would just feel so lonely. And if you continue down that train of thought, if somebody were to offer you that you could have all of your dreams, all of your aspirations, that five-year goal, that 10-year goal, it's yours. But to get it, you have to give up all of your relationships, all of your friendships. And man, I would just be shocked if we, if we took, that, took that deal. But I'm sure somebody somewhere might take that deal. And I think that they would quickly come to regret it. Man, friendship is something that we just feel pulling at our hearts, right? You ever have that one person that you just, you want to get connected to? And so maybe you start to change the way that you act, or you change the way that you dress, or you, you change the way that you do your hair, or change the way that you, that you talk. And it's just to get that one person's attention, that one person's approval. And so we see and feel the pull that friendship can have on our hearts. And uh, as I was thinking about what is, what is friendship, what is a friend, I was looking around, what are, what are people saying? What, how are people describing these things? And so I was looking around, I found this quote uh, most people attribute to Shakespeare, and I wanted to share this just kind of as a primer for us to get thinking in the direction of, okay, what is a friend? What are we talking about? And kind of, yeah, just use that as a primer into where we're going. And so he describes a friend as one that knows you as you are, understands where you have been, accepts what you have become, and still gently allows you to grow. But before we go any further in our discussion about friendship, I, I just want to spend some time in prayer. And so, Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you and to worship you. God, we love you. And we just ask, would, would you this morning, would you speak to us? I'm just reminded of the words of David in the Psalms that he says, if you remain silent to me, I will be like those going down to the pit. And so, Lord, would you speak to us this morning? And in that regard, God, I offer to you my body as a living sacrifice. Holy Spirit, would you use me as your vessel this morning and anoint the words uh, that come from my lips. And by them, would you bless those that hear. And by them, would you encourage faith and, and grow affection and love for your name. And it's in your wonderful name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. Hey, so... After high school, I joined the Army, and the Army stationed me up in northern New York, and I was at Fort Drum. And it was there that I met one of my deepest, closest friends named Joe. And I tell you, Joe, he was the type of guy that you wanted to be around. He was just joy-filled, fun-loving, the most loyal friend you could ever ask for. He was the guy that could make you feel like you were uh, cramping in the abs and crying, at the same time, because you were laughing so hard. <laughs> he, uh, he was the guy for me that we could stay up till midnight, one, two in the morning, just having those deep conversations about life or anything. He was the type of guy that we could be like, hey, do you want to go for a drive? And we, we didn't have anywhere in mind that we were going, but we could just roll the windows down, turn the music up. We were so comfortable with one another, we didn't feel like we needed to fill the space with conversation because we just wanted to be together. But one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that during this time, Joe is not a Christian at all, completely against Christianity. If given the opportunity, a very outspoken agnostic. And myself in this time, ah. Uh, I was just in deep rebellion against the Lord. I just turned my back against him. I didn't want anything to do 
with him. And maybe you're starting to pick up on a thread that I've been kind of laying out so far, and it's this. That you don't need to be a Christian to experience deep friendship. You don't need to be a Christian to experience real, deep, meaningful, intimate connection with another person. And so if friendship is just this common grace that anybody anywhere can experience, then what are we doing here talking about it? Why are we taking a Sunday morning to talk about friendship? What is so special about it? Well, pause that thought. We're coming back. Just pause on it real quick. Fast forward a couple of years, and Joe meets his now wife. She is a Christian. And within those few years that we fast forwarded through, uh, I left the army. Me and Joe are no longer together. And in those years that we fast forwarded through, the Lord does a work in my heart. Praise God for the work he did in my life. And, uh, and because of that, and because we're separate, now anytime just through text, I'm like, Joe, this is what I believe about this. This is what I believe about this because I've seen and experienced the love of Christ, and I just want him to know. And so we're talking. He's like, hey, I'm really interested in this girl, and she's really interested in me. But she said, in order to date, we have to put God first. And I'm just thinking to myself, man, this is wonderful. And he, he's saying to me, I'm not ready to give up on her yet. I'm going to try out this God thing. And so whether you believe in evangelistic dating or not is irrelevant to this story because it's through Sarah that the Lord does a work in Joe's heart. And now he is a man who loves Jesus and wants to experience him in each and every area and aspect of his life. And the reason that I share this part of Joe's story is that because for the first time a couple months ago, we got to be face-to-face -face in a new way. In a new way outside of a text or a phone call or a FaceTime, I got to experience this side of Joe for the first time face-to-face. -face. We experienced our friendship in a new way, namely as Christian brothers. And so this brings me back to the point that we paused on and makes me ask this question. The question that is, is going to fuel the rest of what we're going to talk about today, and it's this, namely, what is so Christian about Christian friendship? And honestly, it's a shame that we even have to make the distinction Christian when we say Christian friendship, because friendship is God's idea in the first place. Before he created anything, and it was just him, he was enjoying deep, intimate fellowship and friendship within the Trinity. And then after he did create everything, he didn't stay distant. Where do we see him? He's with Adam walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And he's showing us that intimacy and connection and friendship are good and right things. And that when we obey him, when we take heed to his commandments, when we live life in the way that he created it to be, there is always a deeper level of enjoyment. Because he's not trying to take from us. He wants to give to us. His commandments and his way of life are always an invitation into deeper life, meaning, and purpose. And what I mean when I say that is that when he was walking with Adam in the garden of the cool of the day, he wasn't trying to take from him. He wasn't trying to take him away from some work he had on the other side of the garden. No, no, no. He was trying to give to him. He was trying to invite him into deeper intimacy and friendship. And so the same is true for our friendship today. God has created friendship. And so we have to understand what is his intent and purpose behind it so that we can follow him, enjoy him more, and live out our friendships in the way he created them so that we can live life the way he created life to be. But in order to do that, we're going to need wisdom. And so we're going to continue in our series through the book of Proverbs. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Proverbs 17, 17. And so uh, the goal uh, this morning when we look at this proverb, outside of the things that I've already said, is we want to see the wisdom of this psalm, and we're going to see what does that look like when it, what does it look like when it's played out and lived out in a couple other places in Scripture. And so uh, you're probably there. It's up on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. And you know, when I was first reading this proverb for the first couple times, I couldn't help but hear the words of my older sister 
someone who was very influential in my own coming to faith, and, and she would tell me this as we were growing up. It doesn't matter what you do. I will always love you. And so maybe you're someone here today that is searching for that type of love. You desperately desire that type of intimate love. And I want to encourage you today, brothers and sisters, stop looking because that type of love has already pursued you. And it leads us to the first type of friendship that we're going to talk about today, one that has already been made available to you through the work of Jesus, namely friendship with God. And it's from this friendship that all of our other friendships will flow. And if you look back at this proverb, in the back half of it, it says a brother is born for a difficult time. Or maybe the translation that you have in front of you says a brother is born for a time of adversity. And if you want to talk about a, to a difficult time or a time of adversity, the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were alienated from him that we hated him, that in our very nature we were children of wrath. And yet, even while we were yet sinners, even while we yet hated him, even while we yet were alienated from him, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that death was to bring us in. That death was to offer us redemption and reconciliation. And through that death and resurrection, we were given the Holy Spirit through which we can experience life and friendship with the Father and the Son. Philippians gives us a little behind the scenes of what went on in order for that death to happen. And Philippians 2 tells us that he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so he humbled himself by becoming a servant and taking on human form. And so we see that before he became enfleshed, God the Son was enjoying rightful, eternal praise and worship. And when he took on flesh, he didn't require the thing that was due him. And so he left the pleasures of rightful eternal worship to be spit on, to be ridiculed, to be derided, to be a man described as one acquainted with many sorrows so that his people could join in the chorus of that eternal worship. And he had every right to leave us in our difficult time. But instead, he pursued us in love by sacrificing himself. But before he sacrificed himself, before he laid himself bare on the cross, he said some things to his disciples, and I want us to hear the words of Jesus. And this is coming from John chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 12, and he says this. It should be up on the screen. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. And so not only does Jesus show us that a friend loves at all times, he showed us that when we hated him, when we were alienated from him, he, he pursued us in love. He not only shows us that a friend loves at all times, but did you see in verse 13? He says, no one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. In this friendship, he is inviting us to become recipients of the greatest love of all time. And so, do you see how loved you are? Do you see how pursued by God you really are? And through this loving pursuit of us, He's initiating through this pursuit of love towards us. He's taking the first step towards friendship with you and I, who are totally undeserving. God, who is high and lifted up, holy, completely deserving and worthy of all praise, worship, honor, and glory, wants a deep, intimate friendship with you and I. Jesus says, I have called you friends. So we got to stop running from him got to. He pursued us in love, knowing everything about you and I. Not only did he form you in your mother's womb, 
Not only has he numbered your days, not only does he know the number of hairs upon your head, the psalmist says that he is a God who searches hearts and minds. And he is a God who knows the secrets of the heart. He knows every single sin that you and I have ever committed. He knows that deep, dark thing that you've never told anybody about because you would be afraid of what they would say or think about you if they knew the truth. He knows the most disgusting thing that has run through your heart and mind, that you would just be ashamed if, if someone knew that's what you were really thinking. And yet he still said, I'm coming after you. And he didn't say that maliciously. Don't get that twisted. He said, I love you. I'm pursuing you. I'm coming after you. And so if we are fully known, then we are fully loved. But I got to ask, how do you respond to this invitation of friendship with God? How do you respond to this invitation of friendship with God when you mess up and you sin again? When you do that thing that you said, I'm never going to do that again, and yet you find yourself there one more time. How do you respond to that invitation of friendship then? Is it hard to go to him? Do you feel like you can't go to him? Do you feel unwelcomed? I got, that is the enemy's lie. Of course he doesn't want us to go to him. We used to be in the domain of darkness, and he came and rescued us and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. If he pursued us in love while we were his enemies, then why would he push us away now that we're his redeemed children? He's drawn to the broken because there is healing and wholeness and restoration and reconciliation in the name and blood of Jesus. So in response, can we just pursue him back? Can we just pursue him back? Jesus said, I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. So look at, it, look at his communication. Last week, we heard that God is a communicating God, and then when he speaks, we have the opportunity to listen, hear, and respond. He said, I have, made you, I, I have I called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. Look how he's saying he hasn't left anything hidden. He hasn't, he's laid everything bare. But you want to know a great way to kill a friendship? Stop talking. Stop responding. In this renewed and reconciled relationship with God that Christ has bought us, there's so much more room for more deep, intimate connection and fellowship with the Lord. He invites us to enter into the closet of prayer to get alone with him. Don't waste that opportunity. Do you see what's happening? The king of the universe, the one through which everything has life and breath, the one who holds every star in his place, every atom in his place, not taxed by any of that, is offering you to get alone with him in prayer. And it's through the opportunity of prayer that he's saying, I care about you. I have time for you. I am available to you. I want to know what's going on in your life. Not that I don't already know, but because I'm inviting you into a personal relationship. And so I heard this sermon not too long ago. It was talking about prayer. And it was saying that oftentimes we will pray just enough to make our conscience feel good. That a lot of times our prayer will just look like wishing in the direction of Lord. Could you give me this? Could you do this for me? Instead of deep, intimate connection, where, where true prayer and connection with him does look like that asking, but it involves praise and worship, thanksgiving, where we go to him with all of our hurt because he cares, and where we just abide in him in a way that we're in constant communication because the Bible says we should never cease in prayer. He's inviting us into a personal relationship with him. And so let's not get stuck in those habits of just praying enough to make ourselves feel good or just wishing in his direction. Let's engage in this friendship that has been made available to us. Let's make it a point 
to get alone with him, to sit at his feet, to be still, to hear his voice, to pray those words back to him, to get alone with him in prayer, whether that be in the closet or the car or the, or the bedroom or the kitchen, even the bathroom. And, but let's not also forget about the wonderful opportunity of connecting with him along with others. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. And this is our opportunity to reflect the pursuing love that Christ has shown us to our brothers and sisters, and now we're talking about friendship with other believers. And the one thing I want to point out about this proverb is that it's not talking about two different people. It's not talking about your friend and then your family member. No, no, no. It's saying that a real friend loves you through thick and thin. And that he's not going to bail on you when the going gets tough. It's that when he loves you in the worst and he's seen the worst of you, he becomes more than a friend. He becomes a brother. And Paul helps us understand what this proverb looks like when it's lived out. Romans 15.2 says, Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. But before we go any further, we need to understand how Paul is using this word neighbor. And I want to tell us that when he says neighbor, he really has the church in mind. And we know this in, in, in two ways. There's two clues that give us uh, this trajectory. And the first is the context in which this verse finds itself in the letter. And he is continuing on this idea of how brothers and sisters are supposed to interact with one another through gray areas. He's talking to the church. The second clue that we have that Paul has the church in mind when he's saying neighbor is uh, at the phrase at the end of the verse, to build him up. And in the Greek, this is one word of which there are 18 occurrences in the New Testament of which Paul is responsible for 15. And every single time that Paul uses this word, he is either directly addressing or directly referring to the church. And so this gives us really good insight in how Christian brothers and sisters are supposed to act towards one another within their friendships. And we're seeing that the purpose in Christian friendship is a sacrificial building up of one another. And this shouldn't be any surprise to us because this is exactly what we saw Christ do as he pursued us in love, making friendship with God possible. Because Christian friendship isn't just two friends that just happen to be followers of Jesus. Christian friendship goes beyond just talking about the game or the news. It goes beyond talking about that great new book you read or the new TV show that you started watching. No, no, no. Christian friendship and the purpose of Christian friendship is to build the other person up. And it's not just building them up so that they become a better person. It's not a building up so that they become more efficient at reaching their goals. No, no, no. It's a building up so they look more like Christ. And that's what the pleasing is all about. When Paul says, let each one of us please our neighbor for his good, because it's about their conformity to Jesus. The purpose of Christian friendship is to build one another up so that we can look more and more like Christ. Now, take that knowledge and put it together with the realization that God in his sovereignty has placed us here in this place during this time with these people around us. And you will see that the purpose and our place in the life of our friends is serving the goal to which God has elected them, Jesus has died for, and that the Spirit is working. And I want to say that again. The purpose of our Christian friends and our friendship with our brothers and sisters is to build them up so that we can look more and more like Jesus. And that shares in the same goal that God has elected them. Jesus died for and the Spirit is working. He sacrificed himself to bring us near. He's given us the Holy Spirit, which is committed to making us look more like Christ. And he's giving us an opportunity, inviting us to share in that work in the life of our friends. How special 
is, the, is our Christian friendship. We get to share in the goal that God is working in their life. And so we want to build them up, and that's why faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Because we can't always see our own sin. We have blind spots, and we need a brother or sister to come up to us and to give us a clear rebuke and please us in that way so that we can look more like Christ. We want to build our friends up, and that's why oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Because when you're just going through it, and you need that friend to just sit and listen and speak to you from the depths of his soul into yours and offer you a different perspective so that God can use that person to give his counsel and wisdom to you so that we can be built up and look more like Christ. We want to build our friends up, and that's why a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a difficult time. But we need to remember that this sacrificial building up of one another does not rob friendship of his joy. It doesn't make it so serious that there is no room for joy. No, 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 no. This is how God made friendship to be. This is intent and purpose, and so there's deeper enjoyment in it. It doesn't take away from the, I just want to be with you. Let's just hang out. Let's have a game night or just talk. I love you. I want to be with you, and it's through those great times that there's opportunity to build one another up. And when the going gets tough, there's even more opportunity there, too, to just be with that person, to love on them, to show them the love of Christ, to build them up. But how do we do this? Well, I thought of a couple practical ways that we can live out this building up, sacrificial type love. And the first is this. If you are not in Christian community outside of this Sunday morning setting. And I plead, I'm pleading with you when I say this. If you're not in Christian community, get into Christian community. Because if the purpose of our friendship is to build one another up, to look more like Christ, and you're not in Christian community, then you miss out on the full blessing of this building up. And the people that are in community miss out on the building up that you have to offer because every redeemed child of God filled with the Holy Spirit has a way to reflect Christ that has something to offer when it comes to building one another up. And so if you're not in Christian community, get into Christian community. And the second, second thing I thought about is if you are in Christian community, stop holding back. Because if we never open up about the reality of where we are or what we're going through, then we miss out on the full blessing of the building up from those around us. And so we got to be vulnerable with one another so that we can receive God's wisdom and counsel through the gift that he has given us, namely, one another. And if we only try to share half of what's really going on, whether to make ourselves look better or to manipulate the situation or perception of those hearing, we miss out on the full blessing of the building up. And if you try to put up a front that I got it all together, hey, brother, how you doing? I'm good. Then we miss out on the full blessing of the building up because how is a brother going to build you up if he doesn't know you're broken? And maybe, just maybe, just maybe you feel like your friendships are only surface level and that you don't have deep friends because you haven't been real or honest about the difficult time that you're going through. Maybe you're missing that brother who's born for a difficult time because you haven't been real or honest about your difficult time. Finally, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time, and this extends to our unbelieving friends. While we were his enemies, while we hated him, Christ pursued us in love and showed us that love so we can show that same love to those who don't yet know Jesus. And this is our opportunity to do so. As I was thinking about this, maybe, maybe you're someone that doesn't have much exposure to non-Christian friends. And so I, I got to ask you, what about the people that 
live on your street or the people that live in your building. And that might feel awkward, and so I also thought of another way, a great way that I have been able to surround myself, surround myself with friendships of those who don't yet know the love of Jesus is through a run club. And no, I'm not trying to get you all into running. But what I'm saying is that there are so many groups that meet together for all types of different hobbies or interests. And so if you have time and you have a hobby or interest, there's probably a group out there. And it's a great way to surround yourself with friendships of people that don't yet know Christ. But the one thing is, a friend loves at all times. And so we should never approach evangelism or, or witnessing or sharing the love of Jesus with the idea that says, oh, this person's never going to trust in God. Next. No, 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 no. We love at all times. And I know i, I kind of been talking a while, probably gone over the time limit that I had, but i got to share one more story. And it's this, that my, my grandma, she was born in a non-Christian family. She was born in California. Her dad's work took her all over the country, and it was on her sixth birthday that her dad died. And about four years later, her mom is at work, and one of her work friends comes up to her and introduces her to this guy. And this guy was a believer in Christ. And he took seriously the command of the Lord that is to make disciples. To He took that seriously. And he shared the gospel with my grandma's mom and my grandma. And he started taking them to church. And it was at that church that my grandma surrendered her life to Christ. And it was at that same church where she met my grandpa. And so I can't help but think, if it wasn't for my grandma's stepdad, taking seriously the command of the Lord to share the gospel, would I even be here today? But not only that, my grandparents saw and experienced the love of Christ, and so they raised their kids in the fear of the Lord. And so my dad had the opportunity to see and experience the love of Jesus, and him and my mom raised me and my sisters in the fear of the Lord. And so that we got to see and experience the love of Christ. And the Lord blesses Jade and I with children, then it's my prayer that we would raise them in the fear of the Lord. And if you see that one person my grandma's stepdad, obeying the Lord and stepping out in faithfulness to share the gospel has had generational impact. And somewhere along the line in your story, the same is true. And so can we just obey the Lord in sharing the gospel? We have received such great love through Christ that has opened up friendship with the Lord. We delight in that. That's something we love and cherish. And so could we just show that love to those around us? Let's show that pursuing, unending love to those around us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. We love you. Thank you for how you have pursued us in Christ when we did not deserve it how you have given us redemption and reconciliation, offered friendship with us. It wasn't just enough to just give us new life. You adopted us as your children. You want intimacy with us. You love us. Thank you, Father. Will we just pursue you back? Would you use out from here and love our brothers and sisters to build them up so they can look more like Christ. And would you give us the courage and the confidence when we lack it to share the gospel and to obey you in sharing the gospel because you are lovely. You are wonderful, Lord. And could we just share that love that we delight in you with to others so that more and more people could experience that same delight. Let us not be selfish with your love, Father. Oh, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. And it's in your wonderful name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen.